so my talk is called on fiscal expansion government deficit and debt in an era of low interest rates uh, i think that we would do well to look at the evidence first and look at the statistical picture and we look at her majesty's treasury's operations which i've simplified a little bit um, because it's very hard to understand what they're actually doing and then uh, i come to policy conclusions and then the discussion here's the low interest rates that we see today in historical comparison um, the red line is the bank deposit rate and then the, the dotted line is the, the consult. So um, the interest rates are very low, but uh, we've been there before. So, so we're not in territory which we've never been in. Okay, so those are the low interest <coughs> rates. Um, here's 1950 to 2017. So we are roughly um, today where we have been in, 1900, <coughs> uh, in the 1940s and 1950s. So again, um, this is nothing which is completely new. So, so we've been there before. Public debt, um, that's the uh, green line. Uh, again, this is a long run series, about 300 years of public debt. Um, we are roughly here at about a bit above 80%. Um, so we are somewhere in the middle, more or less. Okay, so again, nothing, nothing to see. It's, it's business as usual. Well, and here's the deficits. Um, so that's the, the zero line, and we are now in deficit somewhere. I'm not sure if you turned into surplus in the UK uh, by 2019. Um, but again, in historical comparison, we, we're doing okay. We're, we're basically average. Um, there's nothing, nothing special here. So um, I would say basically that the UK, the UK is in a very normal position in terms of, of fiscal policy. Okay, so no, no surprises here. Um, how, does, how does government spending work? Um, <coughs> in a paper by, by McLeay and Al uh, from the Bank of England, they, they say that the Bank of England, and that's not news to us, is the monopoly provider of central bank money in the United Kingdom. Okay, so the monopoly issue of, of money. Um, demand for central bank money is the ultimate means of settlement for banks for private and public debts. Okay, so why do we use pound sterling? Why are we not using euro in the United Kingdom? Um, well, it's because we pay our taxes in, in pound sterling, okay? And that is the reason why we accept that currency. And if you, if you come to think about it, um, if you are the monopoly supplier of currency, you are the currency creator, okay? So, so where is the money coming from the government spends? Well, it's typed into existence. Um, that might sound a bit odd, um, but we have modern central banks with computers. Uh, I'll go into the details just a little bit in, in a minute. Um, but it, it's very simple to see if we, if we go back in time. So if you remember when, or well, remember, uh, if, you, if you imagine uh, colonizers going to North America from England, for example, and they start their own village in, in America, um, they create their own huts, which is private sector-based activity. They, they don't need any money. But then they say, we want roads, we want a teacher, we need money. So, so how do we create money? Well, first of all, we force people to pay taxes in US dollars. Okay, so let's say a hub tax of, of $10. Um, and then, of course, people will have demand for US dollars, and then we can try to spend US dollars into existence. Uh, but it's very clear when you go back to United States colonial history, it's very clear that all the money that government spent was printed, and that taxes was, were forcing people to accept this kind of money. And taxes, of course, did, did bring that money back from, from circulation, okay? So taxes and that kind of monetary system where you have paper currency, taxes, of course, do not finance government spending because the government can always print money at basically zero cost. I was at the um, Kansas City uh, Federal Reserve Bank Money Museum a couple of years ago. It, co it costs seven cents US to, to print a banknote for, for the Federal Reserve System. Okay, so, so if, you, if you imagine this kind of world where you have paper currency not backed up by gold or anything, and you have a monopoly supply of, of money, which is a central bank, well, then it's very easy to imagine what's going on. Um, the banks have accounts with the Bank of England. So the Bank of England has a big computer <coughs> screen running some software, and the banks have account there, just like we have accounts online with our banks. And then the Bank of England, they can just mark up and down these accounts and then creating or destroying central bank deposits in the process. Okay, so if government spends, um, they, they basically give the bills to the Bank of England to pay. They basically say, okay, we have now to make a bank transfer or we have to credit the account, sorry, we have to credit the account of 
uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland because one of their customers gets, I don't know, a million pounds. Okay, so where are those million pounds coming from that the Bank of England is basically crediting to the account of Royal Bank of Scotland at the Bank of England? Well, it's just typed into existence. <coughs> it's the same if in a football stadium. So if you watch a football game and it says, I don't know, 1-0 uh, or 1-0, uh, where is the one coming from? It doesn't make sense, that question. Or where is it coming from? It's coming from a software system. It's the same with money. Okay, so banks have an account with the Bank of England and they have the computer system and if government spends, they just mark up the accounts and basically then they, they, re uh, they receive uh, a government bond uh, or it's a bit more complicated, they, they receive some kind of deposit owned by government. Um, again, the details are a little bit more, more difficult to figure out. What is quantitative eating then? So in the US, it was very clear. So in the US, um, I think it was Ben Bernanke was asked on television, where does the money come from for quantitative easing? So when you buy assets from the banking system, where is this money coming from? Is that taxpayers' money? And Ben Bernanke said, no, this is money that we printed. Well, he should have said, we typed that into existence because we don't live in the 17th century anymore. Okay, so quantitative easing is an asset swap. You basically credit the account of the banks on the Fed. Uh, and you receive basically the, the assets that you have bought. And it's kind of misleading so to say that the money that the Fed is crediting to those accounts is coming out of nothing. No, it's, it's the result of a legal contract, okay? You sign a contract as a Fed to buy, to purchase assets from some kind of bank, uh, and then you, you mark up those accounts. That's where the money's coming from, because you have a legal contract that you sign. Just like when you get a bank loan, of course, then you sign a legal contract, the bank credits your account, where's the money coming from? It's not a good question, it doesn't matter, okay. So, government spending is again, Bank of England marks up the accounts of receiving banks, and these then mark up the accounts of their customers who are receiving ultimately the money, okay? So that's basically just one spreadsheet by the Bank of England, one spreadsheet by, by the bank, and they just change their numbers up and down. That's how it works. The Bank of England then is basically compensated, so when they do spend money for the government, they receive treasury bonds, and that is a bit of the simplification, but I think it's, it's easier to understand, from the treasury for every pound spent on behalf of the government. Okay, so basically the UK government says, okay, here's, here's basically the bills that you need to pay for us, but we give you government bonds. So that's basically the asset that goes on your, on your balance sheet. And banks, and they, they basically, ba banks receive, of course, reserves when the government spends, and that means basically that you have a lot of liquidity on the interbank market. Um, and then banks can swap those excess reserves that they don't need for treasury bonds, which, which the Bank of England then is selling them, or which the, the government's debt office is selling to them. Again, it's a little bit more complicated um, in, in the United Kingdom. Okay, so, so basically, Government spends into the economy, creating more reserves, and when they are, are taxing people, the, the money is basically returned from the accounts. It flows back. So the Bank of England supplies banks with reserves as demanded. Um, otherwise, bank transfers will bounce, impairing the payment system. So um, the, the total amount of reserves, of course, depends on how much money the banks are borrowing from, from the Bank of England. Okay, and of course, if, if the banks are solvent, then of course the central bank, the Bank of England, has to basically, uh, well, basically uh, lend out more, um, more, more reserves. Because if they don't, at some point the banks will say, well, I, I have a bank transfer and I need reserves, but I can't get them from the Bank of England. So, so the checks are bouncing, the bank transfers are bouncing. And that, of course, means the financial system is not working. That cannot happen. Okay, so the amount of reserves in the system is, is just what is needed by the banks to, to function properly. Okay, so I come to policy conclusions. Um, government spending works through Bank of England marking up banks' accounts. Um, there's no budget constraint. Okay, so there's no, there's no technical constraint at which the Bank of England says we cannot credit the accounts anymore. Okay, so you can always, at the central bank, you can always mark up the accounts of the banks. Okay, because it's just a computer system and you, you have to have the legal contracts, but then you can do that. There's no limit to that. Okay, it's, um, it's a bit like the uh, ideas of banks, basically. Banks can also create money uh, when they extend loans. There's no technical limit to it. Of course, practically, there are lots of limits to it. So I'm not saying that banks can 
indeed create infinite amounts of money. They, they're normally stopped by, by many different things, uh, legal requirements and stuff. Um, but for the government, it's the same. There is no budget constraint, but of course, that doesn't mean that they, they spend, uh, I don't know, uh, infinite, un, uh, infinite amounts of money. So government can buy theoretically all labor, goods, services, and assets it is offered. Um, but that might drive up wages and inflation at some point. Okay, so if government says we want to hire some people to drive uh, buses, um, then of course, why should there be inflation? But they, if, if they continue to hire more and more people and there's more and more buses that they're buying, of course, the, the bus drivers at some point, they will, they will be in a very high demand and they might want to have higher wages because they say there's a lot of demand for, for our services, so we want higher wages. And that, of course, can trigger some kind of wage price spiral if you have that in, in bigger sectors of the economy. <coughs> okay, so what I'm saying again is that there's no budget constraint um, in the sense that government can create more money, um, but there's a resource constraint. So, so at some point in time, you will have bought all the stuff that's available, and then inflation will be <coughs> indicating that you shouldn't spend more because it will just drive up uh, prices. So where that point is, that basically government spends and then it will drive up the rate of inflation via the, the wages, basically, I would argue. Where that point is, we can only guess. Okay, so I think we all agree on this. So we don't know exactly how much government can spend so that we have basically no inflation. We are trying with Nairu and all these things, we're also trying by, by basically following full employment policies. So that's basically where we would like to be. Um, somewhere in between probably is, is where we will end. Okay, so we, basically Nairu probably was too tight as a concept as it was applied in the recent past. Full employment, I mean, zero unemployment is not what you can get. There, was always, there will always be some, some people who basically choose to be unemployed um, for, for whatever reason. So you will, you will be st stuck somewhere in this spectrum. Well, here's the, the rate of unemployment in the United Kingdom. Um, so again, long-term series, you can see um, these are the, the post-war times where it was extremely low. Um, again, we're basically somewhere where it is roughly average over, over the historical period. Okay, so I would not say that we are having full employment in the UK or something. I mean, historically, that is that cannot be full employment. Um, so that's, again, that's where we are. So the question is, if government would spend more now, today, like a billion or 10 or 100 billion, where would we end? What kind of combination would we get in terms of inflation and unemployment? Okay, so probably you can drive this down, but the question is, will, will inflation come up? And that depends, I would argue, much. Uh, it depends on, on strength uh, of the unions more, more than anything else. Um, because if workers are happy with the, with the going wage rates, then why should there be inflation if you increase government spending? So, the, again, the limit of government spending is the availability of resources. That's the border. Okay, so I think that's, that's also kind of, kind of uh, easy to understand, I guess. Um, so, so if you go beyond this, um, then of course you would create inflation. So, for example, Venezuela, or two, three, uh, two or three years ago, they, they doubled the minimum wage. Okay, um, but, but the productive of capacity of Venezuela was already reached. So if, if you double the minimum wage, um, then of course you, you will have government spending leading to, to inflation going up, okay? If the supply side cannot react because of resource constraint reasons. Okay, so, so when the Venezuelans had their oil money, they used the dollars to import all the, all the consumption goods, or, or many, many consumption goods from Colombia. Okay, so they said, okay, why should we produce toilet paper in Venezuela? We can buy it from Colombia. Okay, uh, and they did that. Um, and then, of course, when the oil money was gone, then they, they tried to increase government spending, but there was no supply coming forward, uh, and the Colombians did not accept Venezuelan currency uh, for, for exporting toilet paper. Okay? So, if we have full employment, okay, so this is a neoclassical case, and then if government spends more, what will happen in, in the way that the system works now, well, it will create more inflation, then the Bank of England will increase the interest rate, private investment will collapse, and <coughs> by collapsing, private investment will make avail available resources that then are available for, for the government to use. Okay, so that is basically the way uh, the current system is, is set up to work. Okay, so um, again, government, when it spends more in terms of full employment, uh, increases the rate of inflation and the Bank of England basically reacts to this by, by basically collapsing private investment um, so that the government can take over those resources. 
In all other times, I would argue that public spending should crowd in private investment. Um, it's more or less an empirical question. So here you have the blue line, government final consumption expenditure, and the red line, gross fixed capital formation. And the two lines normally go up together um, over a very long term period. Well, this is only until 1950 or something, or 60. Um, but you can see that basically this confirms the story of crowding in. Okay, so if, if you believe that there's crowding out, you would basically say then if the red line goes up, um, then probably it is because the blue line goes down, and whenever the blue line goes up, the red line should go down because government spending crowds out the, the private investment. But here you can see it doesn't. It doesn't. And it's kind of logical, I would argue. So, so whenever government is, is creating something new, for example, in, in terms of real estate, okay, so if, if in London you're building new public real estate, then of course the private sector says, oh, this is a very nice public park now that you have reformed it. Uh, let's, let's basically buy up those houses around it and, and basically rebuild them and make them nicer and then sell them on the market for, for money, for profit. Um, so that's what you can see. So again, this kind of crowding out, crowding in thing, for me it's more an empirical question than a theoretical one. So now for the discussion. Um, Tim Congdon has criticized MMT in a newsletter from, from October 21, and of course I, I want to, to show that to you and, and basically talk about it. Um, so he agrees with the idea of, of creation of money out of thin air, so I think you would also agree that the idea is that it's basically a legal contract which is the basis. Um, and you warn that it must be heavily qualified in practice. Um, basically, you say that the demand to hold real money balances is finite, and that excessive rate of growth in nominal money balances causes inflation. Um, to which I would say, well, if you if you look at the data here for the United States, um, this is M3. I know that you have the shadow stats that you are normally using. I, I couldn't get those numbers because you would have to to pay for them. Um, but the, the shadow stats normally, is, it's a question of level, so you would basically have the, the blue line uh, being higher than, than otherwise. Um, so the, for me, the relationship between M3 and the consumer price index in the, in the United States, it's not so clear. Um, so I would say the demand to hold real money balances may, may be finite, um, but every dollar spent by the government in the US is offset with a dollar worth of treasury bonds, okay? So, so if you are working for the government, because the government in the US spends more, and you basically say, I have too much liquidity, I have too much cash, you can always go to the bank and say, here's my cash. Uh, either I want bank deposits or I want a treasury bond. Okay, so, so that is, for me, the, the demand to the real money balances is, is not a problem when it comes to government spending. Because again, it, the, in the US, the, the government spending is technically set up that every time the, the Fed is crediting accounts uh, for the government, for the US government, they always uh, increase the amount of treasuries um, by, by a single dollar for every dollar worth of spending. By the way, government bonds in the US, uh, they do not exist in paper form, they do not exist in currency form anymore. It's a balance sheet entry. Okay, so this is where we are in the 21st century. Uh, government bonds, um, again, not in paper, not in digital form. It's, it's a balance sheet entry. So if you want to buy government bonds, basically your bank will move the money from, from some deposit uh, uh, um, uh, account into the government bond account. And then it just doesn't mean that you get, that you get the, the interest uh, that you get on those kind of current government bonds. <coughs> so I would argue that uh, inflation is rather caused by rising wages uh, and not the excess supply of money, um, even though, of course, rising wages have something to do with increases in the amount of, of money. So I think there's, there's a connection there which, which we can discuss. So again, the empirical picture, um, non-farm business sector unit labor cost changes in that is the blue line, and the red line is changes in the consumer prices. Okay, so the logic is that basically if unit labor costs go up, it means that wages rise more than productivity, otherwise it would be stable. So if basically wages are rising faster than productivity, we have basically the, the blue line going up, being very high, and you can see that every time that wages are rising much faster than the rate of, of productivity grows, that you will have higher rates of inflation. It's kind of logical, right? I mean, if, if you have an increase in, in monetary wages by 10% and an increase in productivity by 5%, it means people have 10% more money, but the cake is only 5% bigger. So where does the 5% the, the of, of money go that, that is basically not having, is not backed by, by increases in GDP? Well, it goes into inflation. 
Okay, so I think this is why uh, why basically you have to watch the, the situation here of, of wages. I think that's probably better predicted than, than M3 grows, which is more indirect. Okay, so rising wages then uh, are caused then by rising demand, and those this rise in demand might be might be reflected in M3 and rises in M3. That will be my connection to to your side. Again, we're using different vocabulary, but but I think that's where we could agree. Well. I found one of your slides here um, where you say we will discover that in a limited sense the MMT theorists are right and I would challenge you basically to say if, if we would agree on the, on the vocabulary, so either I speak monetarist vocabulary or you take over MMT vocabulary, I think we would agree uh, in, a more, in more than a limited sense. Um, so you say all that the state has to do if it needs to stimulate a depressed economy is to borrow from the banking system and thereby to create new balances and to buy something, anything with the new balances from the non-private sector, etc. I think that is QE. Um, but the problem with QE is it does not work properly. So again, coming out of uh, the empirical uh, observations. So why should people spend more money if their portfolio is more liquid? Okay, so QE basically means I have a bunch of, I have, I have some savings in a portfolio and now the central bank is changing that. So it changes the liquidity of my portfolio, making it more, more liquid. But why should I spend more money? Okay, so I, I don't know anybody who says, oh, my consumption depends on the liquidity of my portfolio. Okay, so, so again, that's, I think that's why it doesn't work. And also firms don't invest um, because maybe interest rates are lower because of QE, uh, but demand is not higher. So I've seen the numbers for, for the Eurozone uh, a month ago. And in the Eurozone, the majority of, of companies says we don't increase production because we can't see that there's demand for it. Okay, so it's not, even if the interest rate is zero, they would not increase the amount of, of, of production capacity because they, they cannot see how they would sell it. Okay, so that of course would bring forward the case of, of government uh, spending. Um, GDP and employment then are determined by production, which is determined by total expenditure, uh, not total monetary growth. Firms increase output if they expect to be able to sell more. They don't care about the liquidity of households. <coughs> okay, so again, why, when you ask uh, people from the business sector, why do you not sell more cars, like more, more electric cars also in Germany, uh, they basically say, we don't think that there's a market for that. Okay, that is the problem. No, they don't say interest rates are too high or uh, we're not liquid enough. That's not what they're saying. Um, I would say that probably during the boom, M3 growth and real GDP growth plus inflation strongly correlate, uh, but I would probably think that this is not in the case in the bust. Okay, so uh, I, I know for Iceland, for example, that there was a strong correlation, uh, but that collapsed when, when it came to the bust. Um, total expenditure can be and is influenced by <coughs> government spending, which creates additional incomes by spending more. Okay, so again, um, of course, a government deficit is what you get, and then you get a, a private sector surplus, and you can say surpluses and deficits balance, but the good thing is, of course, that if the private sector has a surplus, they probably spend more money because they have higher income, higher wealth, but the government do does not spend less because they have a deficit. Okay, that's the big change. Okay, so the private sector cannot create money out of nothing. Okay, so we have to, to basically contract our spending if we are running out of money, but the government cannot run out of money. So again, if the government has high public debt, it does not have to cut back uh, its, on its government spending. <coughs> um, let me just skip this to, to end the, the discussion here. So there seems to be some uh, agreement, um, but I, I want to point out again that MMT is not about bank financing the federal deficit. I would not know what that actually means. So again. Uh, government spending works through the Bank of England crediting accounts. They don't borrow. The Bank of England does not borrow money to credit accounts. It's, it's technically impossible. So MMT is about the right size of government spending. Okay, so we basically say, well, if you think about all the things and you look at the numbers, maybe we could spend 10 billion pounds more and still have the same rate of inflation. Or just maybe a little bit higher. Okay, that's the point. It is not about how it is financed, okay? Just like in, in the UK, also the Fed always credits the bank accounts when the government spends. It's, it's not about financing, okay? More government spending does not equal a bigger state or a bigger public sector. So additional government spending can, can be used to buy stuff from the private sector, so we will not have an increase in public sector uh, or uh, um, employment. You can, uh, you can also 
well, you will also not have a bigger state because you don't have to hire public employees if you want to increase government spending. So politically, all options are there, okay, right wing, left wing, everything in between. More government spending can increase innovation, though, in the private sector by crowding in uh, and increasing productivity uh, through better and cheaper public services. So um, I've, I've used the tube uh, and <coughs> was kind of busy. So um, if you would basically in increase public spending there, probably people could, could go to work much faster, um, maybe also more, more, more cheaper. Um, so, so government has a role to play, uh, of course, when it comes to provision of infrastructure. So unemployment can be reduced um, by reducing working hours, if you, if you prefer that. that. That is also a possibility, so especially if you think about the, the environment and you think about the Green New Deal or something where you say, well, we want to use less resources, uh, so, so it's, it's an open option. And in the end, when it comes to, to basically government spending, the targets, I believe, are full employment and price stability, uh, and then also a sustainable economy. I think that's, that's a new one. Um, and I think the discussion is basically about uh, full employment price stability, but it's a matter of degree, and I would not say it's a matter of, of some kind of revolutionary change of the monetary system. So thank you very much.